What up, what up, what up? It's Ibn Webb, Ib Webb, Quran is some here. Take our swing over to Quran for the moment here for this one here. Man, I think about it as far as just um becoming an adult, later on becoming a father, and becoming a father of a of a daughter. You know, you don't know what to expect sometimes. But any child, you don't know what to expect, man. You just hope 10, 10 fingers, 10 toes, even if they don't have that, you just do the best you try to provide for them. You know, with that being said, you know, my wife and I, we've been fortunate enough to have an opportunity to um, put the little one in some things to one include in dance. And boy, does she love to dance here. And um, just have an opportunity to meet and interact with all her dancers, teachers, instructors that she's had. Um, they all have been great, too. Um, they all come to mind here. I know um, one that oversees a couple of the programs that the little one does here. You know, um, reached out and asked her what she mind just jumping on. Just love to just hear kind of how she got started, you know, while uh, being an instructor, teaching and just working with kids and doing her own thing here, you know, um, and just being being one of those important people in the community here, you know, while uh, indirectly, you know, me just, you know, looking up to her and everybody, all her, her staff and everything, like, how do they do this? How do they just mold these individuals, you know, from not being able to take one step to next thing, having a whole choreograph production going down here. So Ms. Shenway was, you know, kind enough to say she, uh, she'll come on and, and talk a little bit here. And like I said, I'm, I'm completely, completely honored to um, have this opportunity. So with that said, I'm just going to pull her in. Hold tight. Hey, <laughs> hey, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for doing this. Oh, thank you. And um, I know you're recording until the first time I missed him. I logged on late, was busy, uh, and so we were scheduled. <laughs> but you know what? It's like the universe situates things so it's on the ideal schedule, right? Like if you were not on the ideal schedule, the universe is like, let's make it Sunday. <laughs> so, uh, and it's all good. It's meant to happen when it's supposed to. So it's all good. Mm -hmm. It's all good. Like I said, I'll just... We're talking to you a little bit, and I know I, I shared a little bit of what I've been doing. Like, it's just something I just did on, you know, on the fly here and just continue to just, you know, I get excited doing this stuff. I mean, you know, I and mean, it's been cool. Like I said, it's been, a, it's been a fun deal. Just learn a little bit about individuals and a little bit, a little sneak peek into their world. So, so, so it's been cool in, in that aspect here. So I appreciate you just taking some time out. All right. I'm cool. excited. Cool, cool. Yeah, get a little nosy. I get too nosy. Just tell me, you know, Karan, shut it down here. So, uh, <laughs> not, a, not a problem here. Well, you know, I, I am a very open book, and I have pretty much no TMI threshold, which people who know me well, they've learned that the hard way. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, not, at least they know. They know what time it is. <laughs> so, um, I know Hartford, were you, you, you born and raised in Hartford? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. So, I am, you know, I think we got into a point where we're open-minded, more open-minded of the different ways that Black can look. But when I was a kid, because I was very, very well-spoken, no one believed I was from Hartford. Nobody. I'd go out to other places and white folks who met me were like, oh, are you from another country? <laughs> and, and then Black folks who met me were like, oh, where are you from? And I say Hartford. People would not believe me. They're like, no, you're from Glastonbury or West Hartford or something. And you know, like, you have to prove that you're from Hartford. They get down and dirty with you. Like, oh, yeah, if you're from Hartford, what street are you from, right? <laughs> and so they would be like, you know, prove it. You do not seem like the Hartford type. And uh, I'm glad that we're starting to get past that type of thinking because, you know, Black people come in all shades, all types, all ways of speaking. You know, some of us are geeks. You know, my Captain America shirt here. Some of us aren't. <laughs> and it's all good either way. But yes, born and raised in Hartford. And anybody listening, if you need me to prove it, keep in street. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's funny. That's fun. Only child? Oh, no. I am the oldest. I have two younger brothers, and there's a big age gap. I am seven years older than the middle and about 14 years older than the youngest. Okay, so. okay, okay. So you you had, to, you had to set the tone here. Oh, yeah. A lot of babysitting mm -hmm. growing up. A lot of babysitting. Yeah. 
how's your childhood like? I mean, I, I know everybody says normal, but everybody's normal is different. So how, <laughs> how's your childhood uh, like? Okay, well, um, it was it was weird. Um, so the North End, um, some people don't know, it was a predominantly white neighborhood about two, three generations ago. So when my grandparents bought a house there, uh, they were one of the first black families to buy a house and move in. And when my parents were kids, there were still, you know, like about a half and half neighborhood as it was transitioning. So my early childhood, um, the North End of Harford was still very much more kind of a middle class feeling black neighborhood. It had turned all black by the time I was a kid. Um, but you know, you knew your neighbors. I knew the Montgomery's next door. We knew the people across the street, you know, um, Tony Harrington's mom owned the building across the street. He lived there. We knew him. You know, so you knew a lot of your neighbors. Um, my grandparents were our next door neighbor. And then my other grandmother, my maternal grandmother lived like down the block. And so that was what I consider kind of an idyllic phase because the way we know the North End now today hadn't really transitioned yet. You know, it was in that process. Um, you know, the 80s hit, crack started hitting really hard. Um, a lot of the folks, you know, as, um, you know, it was an all black neighborhood because of the redlining. Once black people started right. moving in, they could only buy homes in, in a certain That's area. Hard, right? So in the 80s though, you started to see there was opportunity for folks to start moving out. And by the time you hit the 90s, most of the people who could afford to leave had left. So a lot of that, you know, kind of middle class black folks in my neighborhood, they were gone. And it just transitioned. Uh, and we know that one of the things that happens is if you group a whole bunch of people together with the same or similar levels of, of poverty and struggle, you see very predictable outcomes. This doesn't matter what the race, what country, you know, this happens everywhere around the world. So as collectively more and more people who were working class or poor class moved into the neighborhood, predictable things happened. Violence rose, drug use rose, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I went from a childhood where, you know, it was unthinkable to have gun violence nearby to, you know, like a teenager where it was normal. You know, it's like, that's what happened, especially in the summertime. You heard the helicopters and the gunshots, and that was just, that was the neighborhood. Um, so much so that the first time I ever left the neighborhood for a significant amount of time, I was like, wow, what is this thing called crickets? I can't sleep. <laughs> you know, where's all the cars and the talking and the, you know, like it was just not the same. Um, but with that, I think, um, my mother had some tough choices to make uh, because my father, unfortunately, was lost to some drug addiction. So by the time I was about 12, he was like in and out of rehab and then largely just gone from, from the time I was about 12 until they divorced when I was uh, getting ready for college. And so that, that older gap of my childhood was very challenging because I became the second adult in the household with my younger brothers, you know, so when my mom was working and I was home with them, I had to make sure people ate and got homework done, got into bed, et cetera, et cetera. And it was a lot, you know, I, I don't, I don't think my teen self understood how much work that was because it was normal, but my adult self was like, wow, that was a lot that was required of you for a 15, 16, 17 year old. Um, and um, when I say I babysat a lot, it was like, you know, anytime my mom wasn't home, I was in charge. And then because my dad was not around, I was the person as the, you know, and this will, people will laugh if you see me in person, cause I'm little, like I'm very short, but I was the next biggest, strongest person in the house, you know, cause when I was, uh, 16, 17, my youngest brother was this skinny little 10 year old and the toddler. So when it snowed, I was shoveling. When the trash needed to go out, I was taking it out. Um, and we've always had pets. When my cat decided to drag some poor half living thing <laughs> into the house and it was running around all bleeding, my mother go, oh, Shinway, get it, get it, it's the mouse, you know? So I was doing all these things that now I understand would have been like the dad's job to do, um, but I was doing them because they needed to be done. So um, that was that was a challenge in a lot of ways, but you know, you don't tend to understand you don't understand the fullness of it until you're past it and you get to look back, you know? Uh, so, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I would say 
a lot happened in my growing up years. Uh, and I'm happy to say that my father did recover and get clean. And uh, we're very close now. He lives in Springfield and he's remarried. And I have a whole like step family that comes with that with a, a step mom. And, and hopefully if all goes well, they're going to take my child next weekend and she'll spend the night. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. I, I know what's that all about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, even with that, um, you mentioned all the stuff that you had to do you know, at a young age. How'd you do that? You know, juggling school and extracurricular activity. How, how'd, how'd you ju juggle all that? Man, like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, like, you, you do it because you have to. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, especially as a Black woman, when you look at your aunts, your grandmother, your mother, I mean, these are some warriors, mm -hmm. right? It, it never even crossed my mind that I would not be doing these things and, or, you know, that I couldn't get them done. You know, it's like my mother was working a nine to five plus, you know, she's a professional singer for the extra money. She was gigging on the weekends every Friday and Saturday night, sometimes Thursday, Friday, Saturday night. So all three of those nights, you know, I was home with uh, the boys and she wouldn't be back until, you know, 4 a.m. half the yeah, time. Yeah. And, and so, you know, you do it because you have to. It doesn't even cross your mind that it would be different. Um, you know, I look at my grandmother and my grandparents who went through far more open racism than our generation did. They had to do some stuff. Um, one of my favorite stories of my grandmother, um, she was pregnant with her fourth child. My grandmother had 10 kids. Yes, 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, a lot of kids. Uh, but with her fourth child and my, my grandfather on my mother's side is my maternal grandparents. He was actually an officer in the military, which was very challenging for a black man at that time. They were living on a base and her first three kids were three, two, and one years old. And she was pregnant with the fourth. And she went into labor. So he had to come home from the office to be with the other three kids. And she, who did not drive, had to walk to the hospital on base in labor. And when she got there, they told her it was a whites only hospital. And she had to walk back home in labor. And my grandfather then had to call the general on the base and order the hospital to let her in. And then she had to walk back to the hospital in labor <laughs> to give birth. And when she told me this story, I said, weren't you angry? And she says, what is there to be angry about? You do what you got to do and you get it done. And I think, you know, Black women have done that forever. So when you look around at your role models, you, you just get it done. You find whatever way you got to get it done and you do it because it needs to be done. So, you know, now I think this current generation, like the younger generation of black women who've been looking back at the past are like, man, we tired. We are generationally tired and they're they're kind of done. They're tapping out. They're like, we need to really go back to, you know, a different type of lifestyle because we burn our women out, which is true. We do. Um, but, you know, it's like when you don't have. um when you don't have many other choices, you either move forward or you stay stuck. Right. And I'm definitely a move forward person. So. No, nah, that and you said a, you said a mouthful there in regards to just perseverance of a black woman and just you get it done. You get it mm -hmm. done. Whatever yep. you, you you get it done here. And speaking of getting it done here, you all as far as activities, when did you start getting into like the arts and it uh, sounds like your mom was a singer, so you kind of was. It was around you, so uh, yeah. is that is that safe to say? Oh yes. Yeah. So, both my parents are professional musicians. My father plays. There's a list. Hold on, I always got to think of it. Piano, bass, drums. He can produce. Um, you know, put a whole song together from beginning to end in the studio, all of that stuff. My mother's a professional singer. Both my brothers got the music bug. Both of them can play instruments. Uh, both of them can play piano and drums. Um, and both of them sing pretty, pretty well. Uh, my youngest brother is an MC. You know, he's uh, actually officially on Facebook as the life giving MC. Look him up. Life. Okay. Okay. And uh, um, and he's very involved in hip hop culture. And um, my other brother, you know, gigs professionally a lot for a lot of ch churches, plays percussion, and he actually produced 
and created his own whole album, which I'm not going to remember the title right now. Forgive me, Jossie. Um, but he actually has it out there on, I believe, SoundCloud. Um, he produced it and created it about 10 or so years ago. No, was it? See, that's what happens when you get older. Time has different meanings. It was more than 10 years yeah. ago. It was, like the, it was like the 2000s, whatever that was, 20 years ago now. Um, but, but then people see my family and they're like, oh, what do you do? What do you play? And I'm like, yeah, I don't sing. I don't play nothing. I never got that bug. You know, my father tried. He tried hard as a musician. To get you to sing. Try to get you to sing. No, well, my mother wanted me to sing, and okay. then she tried a little, and apparently, my voice just hurts her soul. So <laughs> that was, was short lived. Uh, but my father tried guitar, and then he tried piano, and uh, I just it just didn't interest me. You know, like it didn't click. And so, but dance was my thing. Um, my parents actually put me in dance when I was two at the Artist Collective. I'm an Artist Collective baby. When they were on Clark, Clark Street. Clark Street, okay. Mm -hmm. The Clark Street, the original building. I never danced in the new one. It didn't exist yet. Um, so I grew up on, uh, like half of my childhood was spent in the Artist Collective. And I was there from two until 17 when I went to college. Um, and that's where I got my love of dance and um, where I got my start. So, yeah. Wow. Since two years old, you've been dancing. Yep. And been teaching mm. since I was 15. Yep. Now, when you got into it, was it um, any style of dance particular back then? Or was it just, uh, or you did a variety of things? Did a variety. So um, always jazz, tap, um, you know, Afropyrogramic technique, which was a very specific style created by Ako Lee Thompson, who was the master um, choreographer and teacher at the collective for a long time. Um, and then, you know, just a lot of uh, West African style dance, uh, some modern here or there. Uh, and yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. Like dance clicked with me. It made sense, you know, and just just was my thing from the beginning. Now, when you started, so it was just year round once you got going. Because um, the collective, I think they still do a summer program. So, you know, the minute I was old enough, which I think you had to be at least eight, I started doing the summer program and I did it every year until my senior year in high school. Um, my parents did try me in, you know, traditional summer camp stuff when I was younger. And I have to say, I was an odd child because I was a kid who did not like other kids. I was a kid who always wanted to be around the adults. <laughs> and um, so if you want to have my childhood definition of hell, that was sending me to a place with a whole bunch of other kids. Really? Okay. So summer camp was torture. I'm like, so you want me to be with all of these loud kids who don't read books? Because I was a, a heavy reader always through my whole childhood. So fun for me was sitting down under a tree, reading a whole book, eating some food and going home. But instead, I had to run and play and get sweaty and jump in that dirty lake. And I was like, this is not uh, for me. This is not for me. <laughs> so once I got old enough to dance in the summer program, that was it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm kind of going to yo-yo a little bit. What got you into uh, reading books? Oh, uh, well, so my mother, um, her parents were very particular with, with their kids. You had to have activities. She grew up always having activities. You had to read. My grandparents had every year they bought a new set of encyclopedias, which oh, I know those, know. Ooh, those don't even that. exist anymore. Yeah. Thanks, Google. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like there was a traveling salesman come to their door. They would buy a set of encyclopedias <laughs> right. and, and their house was full of encyclopedias, like 10 years worth of encyclopedias from like 1960 to 1970 or something. Um, you know, so they were very much into education very much into, you know, the idea that idle hands do the devil's work. So, you know, all the boys learned carpentry skills and could build a house. All the girls learned how to crochet and to sew. Um, and all of my aunts can make clothing from scratch, you know, like crochet hats and bags and all types of other things. Um, so they were very much into the idea that you need to have things to do. You can't just sit around and do nothing. That's how they were raised. So when I came around, my mother uh, very much was like, okay, we're going to put her in dance. And then um, every Saturday after dance class, because dance class was on Saturday when I was little, um, we would go to the library. And that was okay. the highlight of my week, right? So dance first, library second. 
Um, and I can remember being a little girl walking into the main Hartford Public Library branch, going up the stairs, the winding stairs to the children's department. It was so exciting. And I was always upset because we could only read so many books while we were there and only take so many books home, right? Like, ah. Um, and then my parents did an amazing job making sure they read to me a lot as a kid. And my father, who, um, if you ever meet him, he is quite the character. He's a ham. When he read books, he did all the characters. He did the voices, right? So I can remember the Berenstein Bears, and he'd be, blah, 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 blah. he's Papa Bear, and this was Mama Bear. So yeah. it was magical. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just made me love reading and love stories. So the minute I could read myself, that's all I did. Like you gave me a book, it'd be done. Um, so sadly, I do not nearly have the free time nowadays <laughs> to read like that. But um, up until probably my mid 20s, like you give me a book, even if it was about 500 pages, I was done in three days. So, so loved to read. Nah, interesting. How do all those, all those traits and, you know, warm activities reading, I mean, transitioning to high school, what high school did you go to? Harford High, whoop, whoop, Owls. Okay, okay. All right, all right. <laughs> how, how was you as, as a high school student? I mean, I mean, I know you may not mm. like being around kids, did that change? <laughs> like being around teenagers at that point or no not really but i did get a click in high school like i had my own little click you had a name? um no our click didn't have message. a name this message i i think i think what what kind of drew us together is we all were kind of like nerdy you know okay. and uh as far as folks went um so i was in the uh, classical magnet program for middle school and high school and at the time a classical magnet did not have a separate building now it has its own separate building but at the time it was in quirk middle and then harford high so uh for both schools I actually was out of district for me um so i went to harford high even though i should have gone to weaver district wise um so we had a, a very interesting setup because we went to harford high but kind of didn't go to harford high you know like we went to harford high but the classical magnet was separate we had our own set of teachers and mostly had classes with only each other you know like what whatever 50 kids were in our grade in the program so um we were probably the nerdiest group within our group you know so it was like as freshmen in the classical magnet program we were like the five nerdiest and kind of just drew <laughs> together because of such um and kind of stuck as a click through high school um and i'm definitely full on a nerd and a geek um and people go well what's the difference well nerds are into like really intellectual stuff that makes them happy you know like you can be a nerd about vocabulary or politics or video games or whatever but then if you're a geek usually geeks are really really into um you know geeky culture comic books and all of that stuff and i am an anime geek pretty hardcore uh have been my whole life, I go to conventions and everything. Okay. Um, and when I was in high school, um, there were no other geeks. So I had to kind of like get with the nerds. I had no one to, you know, go to cons with or play anime. Mm -hmm. Out and close my door, please. Okay, we'll figure them out later. Out and close my door. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. There, uh, I have my, um, I guess for, you can call, call her kind of like a niece. Uh, she is the youngest sister of my stepdaughter. So she comes with us on the weekends a lot. Uh, and the two, my daughter, oh, and there's my cat. My daughter and her, <laughs> who's eight, they fight like siblings. Yeah, see, I have a busy house, right? The cat's like that. now I see like. That. I see that. <laughs> okay, you're not going to get anything over here, sir. Oh, there you go. But, um, but yeah, um, I will say that I was definitely oblivious to most of life when I was a teenager, you know, I was very busy with home life with my younger siblings, and then I was still dancing, and by the time I was in high school, you're dancing, you know, probably about three to five days a week, depending on the time of year and what performances were coming up, um, plus uh, in the fall I did soccer, um, so I was very, very busy. And in fact, I would very often wake up in the morning and have to wake my mom up for work. 
Um, okay. And then I can remember uh, she would send my youngest brother, and I'm sorry, Azim, yes, this is embarrassing uh, for him. Uh, she would send my youngest brother into the shower with me in the morning so I could wash him up while I showered and then send him out to get dressed and everything. Um, and I always said, tell him, it's like, oh, you were just so cute because he never wanted to be under the water. Nah, no problem. <laughs> I mean, obviously, uh, the opportunity to, to go to college, was that always, I mean, sounds like you've been, you know, obviously educated, well-read, all those other schools. College always the thing to do? My mother told me that college was a requirement as long as I can remember. It never crossed my mind that college wasn't happening. I had been raised to that expectation. Okay. Um, so, um, yes. Yeah, so I went to the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Um, it was an interesting experience because um, my parents who raised me, they, they were both pro, very pro-Black. Um, as a matter of fact, my name is Shinwe because you know, I always tell people it's an African name. I'm not African. Neither is my father. You just have to picture him with a fro. It was the 70s, Black power. So you know, I got an African name, and so did both my brothers. So it had never occurred to me I wasn't going to college. And um, my parents, because they were so broke black, they would always talk about, you know, like the man, the power of the system, blah, blah, blah. And college, though, was the first time, even though they had talked about it and they prepared me for it, it was the first time I was ever in the, an environment where I could be the only person of color in the room. And also the, like, truly, like, I'd look around, I'm like, I'm the only person of color. And it was weird because I'd never been the only black person in a room before. And also because, you know, I grew up in a black neighborhood, we had shades of, of color from very fair to very dark. I'd never been the darkest person in a room before either. I was just like, wait a minute. I'm the not only the only person of color, I'm actually the darkest skin tone person up in this whole, you know, like lecture hall with like a hundred something people. That was new. You know, that was weird. And it made me see, despite, you know, like it's different when, you, when you're hearing it versus when you're experiencing it. Right. When I went out there into that college world, I met so many folks who had no, under, no clue what Black people, our lives and how we lived at all. They were shocked to know that I didn't have any white friends. They're like, how could you have no white? Well, I'm like, how could you have no Black friends, <laughs> right? right? But, right. Uh, but um, you know, in my neighborhood growing up, no white people lived in the North End, none. And the only white people I knew were teachers at school. And I knew that some of my teachers were Jewish. All I knew about them is that the Jewish teachers had more holidays <laughs> than the non-Jewish teachers, right? So the first time I met someone my age who was Jewish was college. Um, the first time I met, you know, quite a few different types of people was college. And, and it's like, Part of that weird part was, I think I was better prepared to be out in the world um, with a variety of people more so than a lot of my counterparts um, who were white because, you know, we here in, in the U.S., you know, we're a very black and white kind of country, but white is, was, is still seen as the standard. So it never occurred to them that they could meet a person who had no white people in their neighborhood, like ever. <laughs> You right. know, right. and that was quite the experience. Dancing in college was quite the experience. Um, it was a modern dance program. And how there's a pick, how did you pick uh, GW? I, was it for dancing or was it for other opportunities? Well, this is this is going to make you laugh. Um, as, as I told you, I was the kind of other adult in my house household all through high school. And uh, when I was researching schools, I knew I wanted to go to a city, but I also didn't want to go to a big city. So D.C. was my ideal because it was about the same size as Hartford. Um, and I knew that would be very navigable for me. Um, but I also did apply to NYU and I applied to Boston University. Um, I got into all the schools that I had applied to. And my mom was like, oh, go to NYU, and then I can bus you home to babysit on the weekends. And I was like, hmm. uh, Washington, D.C. it is. Because <laughs> I, I wanted to escape. I was like, oh, I need, I need a break from this. I need a break. So um, I chose D.C. both for the size and then the fact that um, it was far enough away from home that I would have a separate life, but still close enough that I could get back when I wanted to. So, yeah. And um, 
I did not choose it for the dance program. I just wanted to make sure it did have dance. Um, it did not occur to my 17 year old self that it just having dance didn't mean it would be a good dance program fit for me. Mm -hmm. which it, which it was not a great fit. It was a very modern based program. And when I say modern, modern dance has has a range, uh, but it was on the kind of very far experimental side of modern dance. Uh, so, for example, um, one of our professors did an entire dance about falling down and the entire dance was people walking across the stage, tripping and falling. And the soundtrack to the dance was people telling stories about times they fell down and tripped. Oh. So very experimental, which coming from, you know, a black neighborhood where like music and energy and community and that like, you know, that vibe you get with the party and the dance. So that was so ingrained into my understanding of movement that I came and I was like, what is this? <laughs> you know, I don't know about this and then i felt kind of hurt too because i'm like i'm i'm very clumsy off the dance floor i i'm always running into stuff and so you had to audition for everything and i'm like how do i not get into a dance about falling down i fall down all the time <laughs> yeah yeah it was a little different a little different very very different yeah <laughs> now did you graduate from there or um yep okay okay yep yep and uh came back home after graduation, uh, which was a decision because um, I met someone in college who, you know, he had a sister and I said, oh, you know, cool. You have, he said, oh, she's a lot older than me. I really don't know her at all. And I realized I'm the older sister. If I, you know, go off and live this life, what does that mean for my siblings? And in the course of college, my youngest brother went from four years old to eight years old. And I'll never forget the day I came home for break and I was going to read him a bedtime story. And he took the book from me and says, no, I want to read it. And I was like, wait, you can read? Yeah. When did that happen? I missed that. <laughs> and I realized, oh my gosh, if I am not around you guys, I will miss huge chunks of important parts of your life, you know, because he was only eight when I graduated college. So came back home to spend time with them, be around those two little knuckleheads and don't regret it. We had some good times. Uh, now, definitely. As far as sounds like obviously dance been a part of your life. And did you know you wanted to continue? I mean, I know you started doing some instructional stuff as a teenager. Did you sense as an adult you wanted to continue with all that? I never thought it would be a possibility. Um, you know, well, the dance world, especially growing up through the 80s and the 90s, it was a uh, professional level dance was predominantly white, predominantly ballet centered. Um, and that came with some things, you know, dancers were supposed to be lean, fairly tall, about five, six plus. I am not <laughs> on a good day in heels. I'm not five, six. So. I never expected uh, professional dance to be a part of my life at all, you know, because I didn't fit the mold. Um, and, you know, there are some exceptions. There's the Dance Theater of Harlem. There's Alvin Ailey. But the competition level for those um, those companies is extremely high. Um, and it would also necessitate, you know, not being in Connecticut. And I knew that I specifically wanted to be back in Connecticut um, and close to my siblings. So I never thought I would dance professionally at all past high school, uh, you know, and, you know, in my adult life. Um, what changed my mind is I tried normal life. Um, so out of college, I uh, became a teacher and I taught high school. And that was not great for me, mainly because I felt what I could bring and the needs that the students have did not match what I was allowed to do within the school system. And that just broke. Um, I was at Buckley High School. Um, okay. And, you know, I, I, what do you say to a kid, 18 year old, who tells you, what's the point of reading this book? I'm just going to end up in jail anyway, like my dad and my uncle. Mm -hmm. And I don't have the power to, you know, change his circumstances. But within the school system, I also didn't have a lot of ability to do things for this kid the way I thought they should be done. Okay. My job was to get you to read this book that I know 
for what your current and immediate needs are are not going to fix anything. And that's hard to be able to tell an 18-year-old reading this book is going to improve your life somewhere down the road. And I was like, is it, is it really, though? What does this kid need most? Does he need to know how to read? Yes. Does he need to read this specific book? Probably not. Mm -hmm. Probably what's better for him is to understand how being able to read a job application ties into the immediacy of his life so that he does not end up in the street life, right? But instead, I'm supposed to have him read this book, which has almost no connection to his current concerns and his current lifestyle. So that was hard. That was hard seeing kids from the neighborhood. I'm like, I'm from this neighborhood. And I know, like, I know what it's like that you're walking down the street and you hear some, you know, like a car starts driving real slow and you're like looking around, like, where do I go? Where do I duck? Where do I run? Can I really look this kid in the eye and say, you really need to learn Shakespeare? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that it just didn't, it didn't sit right with me. And Within the, the context of working in a public school, there's a lot of rules of what you can and cannot do, right? So like you see a kid, they don't have a ride, it's super cold tonight, you know how far away they live and you know when they get home, there's no food in the house and, and their mom is you know, abusive. At the very least, should I be able to give them a ride home in a warm car? Yes, I should, but I can't. I can get fired for that, right? Mm -hmm. So that did not sit right with my spirit looking at what I knew the kids needed versus what I was allowed to do. So I did not stay. I did not think I was going to do my best work there. Okay. Uh, so then I tried corporate, hated corporate profoundly, um, could not, could not be myself and felt a big disconnect. I, I ran into a lot of stuff that I realized later was the subtle ways racism plays out in the lives of black people. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, you know, growing up, you know, black folks, the way we talk to each other tends to be culturally very direct, especially when you're a kid, you know, your mama don't say, hey, do you think it might be time for bed and you should think about moving on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, no, your mama be like, it's time for bed, go, go brush your teeth, be gone, right? Like, it's very clear what you're supposed to do. So I had grown up in a life where people were direct, they told you exactly what they wanted, blah, blah, blah. I went into a corporate world where my supervisor would come in to, you know, my, my little cubby desk area and says, hey, I noticed that there's a bunch of files in XYZ area. And I'd go, okay. And in my mind, that was make a mental note of it and get to it when you can, right? Because she did not say explicitly, can you go file those right now? So I would be constantly um, pissing off my supervisor without knowing it because we had a disconnect in the way we communicated. Okay. And I knew on some level that it wasn't, you know, me being like stupid or, or insubordinate or on purpose or anything. I tried to explain that to them. Like, I don't understand what you mean. If you want me to do something right now, why don't you say, can you please do this right now? Like I actually got called in for insubordination. And they're like, you know, and, and they even told me that. It's like, you never do what she tells you to do. I'm like, what are you talking about? I always do what she tells me to do. I said, well, the other day I mentioned those files. I said, yes, you mentioned them. You never said go do them right now. Right. I got to them before the end of the day. What is the problem? So it was constantly a disconnect. And I knew that it was, um, you know, racial, but I didn't have the language and understanding at that time to adjust or to be able to explain to them um, what it was. And we also weren't in this current era of diversity and inclusion. So anything that I did that they didn't like became my fault, no matter what. So it didn't last long there. Um, and then I said, okay, you've got to change it up. And what what makes you feel at home? What makes you feel like yourself? What what makes you happy? And I realized dance had to be a part of my life. If I was going to be happy, dance had to be a part of my life. Um, I also realized that like a, a standard nine to five schedule was not going to work for me. And um, and in fact, most working artists do not have a standard nine to five schedule. Um, and so then I started going, OK, let's figure this out. So, you know, I started working retail part time and teaching part time and, and all that type of stuff and uh, have been doing that kind of lifestyle ever since. So since 
since about 24, 25, yeah. Uh, and then even with, with that shift, where did dancing come into play at as far as um, teaching and instructing and actually performing? I mean, where did all that um, tie in at? Well, I made being able to teach and being able to dance my priority. So that was always my first priority and everything else was secondary. So I worked retail because it allowed me to have a flexible schedule so that I could prioritize dance. Um, so, you know, I started teaching at a studio. Um, I started teaching at a variety of studios um, all over the place. Um, so I've taught in Southington, Enfield, West Hartford, Canton, South Windsor, uh, Cromwell, uh, Hartford, you know, like, so I've been all over the greater Hartford area with a variety of studios, um, after school and dance programs, uh, et cetera. And um, you, we met when I was running Let's Dance at the YMCA. Um, and one of the shifts I made um, in my late twenties, as I said, okay, you know, like, you know, as you get older, life gets more expensive <laughs> because you need more things. Like you start thinking about, okay, we want a house at some point, blah, blah, blah. So I said, okay, I need a bit more stability than what I currently have. And so I decided to go into arts administration um, as a parallel to um, instruction. And so I started running dance programs um, as opposed to just teaching in them. So when the opportunity for Let's Dance came along, I hopped on it pretty quickly um, and was with the Y for about a total of, of uh, close to about nine years, actually, altogether. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, you know, did that, all of the administrative and, and direction side of the program in addition to teaching it. And uh, really loved it. Really loved it. I miss. I miss the kids so much. I miss the list dance program. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, even even the instructional and even administrative part. I mean, all this stuff here is the dance business similar to you mentioned. You was in the corporate world. You know, the retail is a lot of similarities to it as far as behind the scenes, as far as trying to make things work, or is it is all different lane here? Um, it's both different and the same. Okay. It's different because as a working artist, people have an expectation already of you to be quirky. <laughs> so it was a place that I could more fully be my true self without people feeling it was inappropriate, right? Especially when you work with kids, you get a lot more leeway to be silly and goofy and, um, you know, wear all my my unprofessional T-shirts and, and whatnot. Um, and and people expect you to be a character. Um, but on the flip side of, of the back end, when you're looking at the administration, it is very similar to corporate because what you're looking at is um, always needing funding, always um, trying to raise money, apply to grants. And when you're working for a larger entity who, despite their nonprofit status, you know, they also have a bottom line they have to meet. There's always constant tension between running the program the way you know it needs to be run and running the program in a way that is sustainable for the funding that you get, mm -hmm. right? Um, and a lot of that tension involves you and your staff going well and above and beyond your job description to make things work. Um, and then lots and lots of meetings where I have to <laughs> justify and beg for scholarship money, you know, for certain kids and, and try to make people understand uh, lifestyles that they have no real clue about. That is really, really, truly a challenge. Well, well people will say, no, I, I once had someone say, you know, we'll scholarship this kid in for a year or two at most, but after that, circumstances have to change. You can't be in the same position that you were, you know, two years ago. And I'm like, you do not know the people in this right. neighborhood. Right, right. <laughs> you is like you are not you know you're scholarshipping in you know because those circumstances this kid is in is about who their parent is which they have absolutely no control over right um i've had students who you know you have a parent who's struggling with mental illness and they want their kids to do well but they themselves aren't doing well you know they can't even get themselves to get up and come to the building to sign a paper so that their kid can go on this field trip or whatever. So what do you do? You get in your car and you drive to their house, mm. <laughs> you know, and you walk into, you know, it's a kind of a, a full amount of chaos because they're not doing well in life right now, um, but you get that paper signed so their kids have this opportunity. But when you're trying to um, 
make sure that the program is running and you're trying to explain these types of things, um, I find very often, particularly in the nonprofit world, there's there's constant tension between um, what you have to do to make a program work and the funding you get. And if you're not willing to basically do a lot of stuff that you don't get paid for, uh, a lot of these programs would not exist. And I, I've seen every single one, the people who run them, they're sacrificing for it to exist in the first place. No, yeah. no, you're right. No, you're right about that. I mean, even with all of that, um, did you have you found time? I mean, throughout the throughout your travels as an adult, doing all this stuff, find time just to to dance, just for yourself, just to kind of. Mm-hmm. Did you well, ever find, find any time for that? Well, one of the best parts of being an administrator and you're there all day long is like there were times where I'm like, you know what. I'm going to just take the next 45 minutes. I'll be in the studio (laughs) if you need me. And you just, you go change your clothes and you put on the song and you just go and you release and it is the best thing. And then you go, Oh, I like that move. I'm going to use that in this piece coming up, you know? Um, So that I do miss. I I don't have as currently as a non-administrator for a program, I don't have just endless access to a studio, pretty much what I want it. I do miss that. I'm trying to figure out how to get that back in my life. But um, the other thing that I very much enjoyed is uh, the dance staff. You know, they're always involved with a variety of projects throughout the greater Hartford area because they're dancers too. So I performed with them. They've performed for me. You know, we've done a lot of that stuff and that has been really, really fun as a dancer. Yeah. No, it sounds like it. Definitely sounds like it. And then even with, with dancing and all, what, what, has it, what has it taught you that sticks with you to this day? Hmm, that's a good question. Well, first of all, I think the arts are essential, absolutely essential. And one of the biggest things they teach you um, when you grow up um, in the arts, you know, that that um, saying the show must go on, Mm -hmm. you really do learn that you learn, okay, this is not working, but we have to move forward. What can I do change fix immediately right now so that we can take this next step? You know, because you're in the middle of a live show it doesn't stop just because there's something wrong. Right. Um, So I have learned a lot of on, you know, um, on my feet thinking um, very flexible and adaptable in the moment. What can we do and transition to, to change this up and keep this moving, which is truly an essential skill. I've, um, I've done a lot of other things that are outside of the realm of performance that those assets are vital. Like, you know, when you're, interviewing other people or you're on a radio program or you're doing all these other things, you got to think on your feet. There is no time to be like, can you pause for just one moment while I figure right. out <laughs> what right. I'm going to do next? No, people are there. They're waiting. Things got to move. Um, with performance as well, it, it teaches you how to read energy, read a room, right? Um, and kind of get the vibe of people and, and figure out what to say, what to do next. Um, And I think probably the biggest thing is, even though culturally there's a lot of differences between different groups, essentially we are all people with the same basic emotions and joys and hopes and dreams. And that is part of what brings us together as human beings. So you learn to connect with that vital human part of yourself and put it out there for someone else to see and hold into their heart. Um, It reminds you that you know, underneath this outer skin color and hair texture and and whatever kind of uh, assignment you had at birth, that underneath it all, we still all want and need the same basics. You know, we all need water and food and love and, and to be held sometimes and all that good stuff. So I think arts are really, you know, I say it's like human heart. You can't spell heart without art it really is essentially who we are as human beings. It's one of the earliest forms of culture we ever developed. Mm. No, well said, well said. Now I got this, um, yeah, a couple of more minutes for me. Yeah, yeah. Now I I was gonna, uh, I do this thing, I just put people on the spot, ask random questions, not so random questions. All right. And, you know, have a little fun here on the back end of all this, if that's cool. Yeah, let's go for it. All right. So when driving, what do you prefer, um, 84 or 91? Oh, 91 because you can drive faster. I'm a okay. speed demon. Okay. Shh, cops, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Oh, we good. We good. We good. We good. 
Albany Ave or Blue Hills Ave? Albany Avenue, because the restaurants on the Ave, the little mom and pop shops, you know how you walk in and people glare at you <laughs> and you'd be like, yes. you got any soup today? That's the best food you ever going to have in your life. Them little mom and pops on Albany Avenue. <laughs> most definitely. Most definitely. When you're not dancing, dancing or reading, what's one of your, your interests here? Oh, uh, well, I told you I'm an anime geek, so anime all day. I'm like, you know, currently behind in all my anime watching, but definitely watching some type of anime. All right. I'm going to take you back a little bit on this. One. I might surprise you. Uh, the Richardson Mall, the Pavilion, or Civic Center when shopping? Ooh. Hmm. Richardson Mall. <laughs> okay. 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 Yep. Mainly because it was closer to the bus I needed to get home. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I didn't have to walk. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, an event here. We got a uh, West Indies Parade or uh, Taste of Hartford when it was on, uh, what's that, uh, what's the Constitution Ave? Taste of Hartford. I like food. Yeah. All right. <laughs> 89.9 or, or 910? 89.9. Okay. Pizza-wise, Mr. Pizza or Woodland Pizza? Oh, Mr. Pizza. Mr. Pizza. Mm -hmm. Dance, love, life, or artist collective? Oh, you just stabbed me in the heart there. So Dance, Love, Life, DLL Studios wouldn't exist if the collective didn't exist. I can't choose. I can't choose. Okay. Yeah. Well, what does our collective mean to you? Oh, well, growing up, it was a second home. Okay. And... um. Not only did I learn a lot there, but um, I did I did a lot. Like I started teaching when I was 15 at the collective. And uh, there was even one year where my uh, jazz teacher, she was sick throughout the whole winter. So I ended up subbing her class for an entire winter. <laughs> so I would teach all Saturday morning from like nine to three in the afternoon, every Saturday for like a whole school year, pretty much. So I learned a lot, I got my chops there. You know, people always knew me. You know, there was someone always that to talk to, some place to be where you felt connected. So, yeah, uh, it was home away from home. Yeah. Performing or teaching? Ooh. Oh, gosh, that's hard. I'm going to say performing only because you get less opportunities, you know, when you are when you're older. We do a lot of programs specifically to give kids a chance to perform we don't do that much for adults so okay okay best part about being mission way huh i guess well right now i will say i've aged into myself perfectly like mm -hmm. i really know who i am i know what i'm about what i want i have you know my values and I love where I am in life. You know, yeah. it's, I've gotten to a really great place for myself. Hmm. Best part about being a mom? Oh, well, my favorite moment every day with my daughter is after she goes to sleep, because I can't do it when she's awake. She moves too much now. But after she goes to sleep, you know, I, I will usually lay next to her and just hold her for a little while. And I just say, you know, thank you for coming to me and letting me be your mom. Um, part of my goal with her was I wanted her to have opportunities in her freedom of her childhood that mm -hmm. I did not. I won't say like, I don't feel like my childhood was horrible, um, but I do remember, you know, my, my childhood was very contained. You know, um, my mother was coming out of very um, conservative ideas of what a girl should be like, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and so I was very much raised to sit up straight, you know, and I can remember in high school, my friends would be like, what are you doing? You know, and I'm like, what do you mean? What am I doing? And I'm, I'm holding my milk carton with my, my pinky extended and I'm sipping it. And they're like, you look like you're at a tea party. I'm like, this is how I drink, you know? So I was always very taught to be like, you are a girl, you must have decorum and blah, blah, blah. And so I very much wanted her to have the ability to be wild and free. Cause my brothers always got to be wild and free. And I can remember being a little bit jealous, like how come they get to run around like idiots and I got to sit here and behave, right? Just because I'm a girl. So 
you know, I said, I want my kid to have like, you know, understand how to, to behave in certain places, but to be able to be wild and free. And as you can see, she is after interrupting me <laughs> two times today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. nah, nah, good stuff here. I know you got a whole lot of more living to do here, but up to this point, what's some, um, what's three of your proudest moments of your life so far? Hmm. Um, one of the favorite projects I've ever worked on, I did choreography for this little off-Broadway show called Confessions of a Wonder Babe. I really enjoyed working on that project. And it was, it was a, it was a scary step because I took on the project, not feeling sure I could do it at the time. Mm -hmm. So it was a growth moment for me. And I'm really forever proud that I did that. Um, second is when I decided that the kind of lifestyle that I had been expected to live, you know, the idea of, you, you know, you graduate and you get your nine to five job. When I decided that wasn't for me, that was a huge and scary step. And everyone I know was like, it's not going to work. Don't do it. Just get a good job. And I actually got told once by a, a financial advisor, you know, get a job and work and then retire and do what you want after. And I'm like, so I should retire at 65 and then become a professional dancer because there's so many <laughs> of them out in the world. So it was a huge, scary step when everyone even my, my mom was like, don't do this. And I did it anyway. And I have never regretted it. Best thing I ever did. Um, uh, I before you say, get to that third one, it's, uh -huh. interesting, it's interesting you say that. I mean, most people, they'll tell you how to do stuff, and they never did it. You know, <laughs> as far as that advice, as far as not to do it, and, and just the freedom that you probably done had and continue to have here. I mean, that, that's, you can't put no dollar sign on that. And I no. and people don't people people don't 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 realize that. I mean, in regards to this whole structure, you grow up, you go to college, and to your point, working nine to five. Nah, that's not life. Then you retire. What you got about 10, 15 mm -hmm. years to enjoy yourself. And to your point, what you you gonna be dancing at 60, 65 <laughs> then? Nah, yeah. it's a whole lot of sense what you're saying. It makes a whole lot of sense. Oh yeah, and and I don't I don't regret it. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's easy. You know, like people right. no, like it's. Definitely. I think people have this idea that that if you've lived this kind of alternative artist life that that you're lazy or you cannot do or you don't want to work. In fact, you work twice as hard as a nine to five person because you have to in order to make the lifestyle work. But to this day, I've never had a boss or supervisor tell me I wasn't going to take a vacation. I'm like, no, I'm here because you want me. I will be gone from this time to this time. <laughs> I will be back. You know, like I have not lived a life where people get to tell me what to do in such a way that I either have to do it or not. I've always been in a position where I'd be like, hmm, I guess I'm not going to return to this dance studio next <laughs> next year. You know, I just go and, and find alternatives and, and, and be done. Um, but let's see, like a, a three. A three is, is um, I think my third thing is, and it's not just one thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I always say that there's magic in the world and everyone has their own type of magic, right? People have different types of magics. Part of my magic is really being able to look at a person and see who they really are and what they really need. And through dance, you know, people think, oh, you're a dance teacher. You just teach dance. No, that's not what I do. I teach life through dance. And I've had a lot of opportunities to impact um, people in a profound way. And, you know, I have a ton of stories that I could tell that I won't because it's not really my story and my business. I've just been a little part of that story. But when you talk about the, the sacrifices and the things that me and that my, my staff, the, the former Let's Dance staff have done to make sure some of these kids that we've worked with and some of these parents have opportunity and have things um, that, that give their lives more meaning and more joy there's things that I've stepped out and done that made something possible for someone and gave them that hope to keep going. Or, you know, the being in that moment where someone decided, you know, maybe I will stick around and live for a little while longer or, you know, that type of thing. And these are not stories I talk about a lot, I, you know, because because I will not mention names. I will not mention dates and places because it's not my story to tell. But to be there in that moment when someone just needed whatever that was and be able to provide it is profound. And when you are with 
someone on a regular basis, an hour every week, you're part of their community. You become part of their life, part of their story. Um, and not everyone has an easy one. Not everyone has a smooth one. You start to find out things sometimes about kids that just make you want to hug them and wrap them up and run away with them because their home lives are so difficult. You know, there's a limit to what you can do, but there's a lot that you can't. Like inside the school system, there's things I couldn't do or say, but as Machine Way, the, the goofy dance teacher, there's more leeway to, to step up in a way. Um, I will tell one like little snippet of of a kid uh, who has a really hard time. There's um, some undiagnosed neurodiversity going on. But what had happened with uh, this kid is bad reports were always coming and, and this kid is being raised by a grandparent, right? So everyone would go to the grandparent when there's something negative. And it gotten to the point in my class where I had to start talking to the grandparent about, hey, we've got some serious challenges, but I never presented as your child is bad or your child needs to, to change. I always say, you know, we have some challenges that we collectively have to figure out together. And through that process, it took a couple months, but then one day I'm, I'm stepping out with the student and, and students looking at me like, oh no, she's gonna come tell my grandparents something again. And I went up to the car and I said, I have to tell you, we had a really good day. And the grandmother was just shocked, right? And I said, you know, I know that people come to you every time something is challenging or they have bad news, but I bet when things are actually good, no one bothers <laughs> to come out and say, hey. And so um, I made it a ritual that every time there was a good day, there was a report just as there would be every time there was a difficult day, right? And just that change started to change the tone with the, the grandparent and the child. And I could see it starting to happen from just this one little thing that I started doing once a week. And it helps people see themselves differently, helps the child see themselves differently, helps them see another way to have relationships with of their community members. So it's not just, oh gosh, every time Ms. Sheenway steps out the door, she's got something negative to say. It's just as often, wow, what a great day. I gotta commend you guys on, on the work you guys are collectively doing. And I always make it a collective, right? It's never just on the parent or just on the child. You're a part of a team that's helping. And I'm a part, you know, like, I'm not a, a full-time varsity member of your team. I'm like the JV bench squad, but when I come out, I'm helping, right? And so it's those moments that remind me why I do what I do. Yeah. And so that at the hardest times, because it's not always easy to be a working artist, you know, but at the hardest times, I know that that, that value that was created, that moment and that, that community and that connection, that's life-changing, not just for them, but for me. And so, you know, when I try to explain to people what I do, like, that's what I do. I have this magic where I can come in and make someone feel truly seen and heard. And, um, and it is a profound thing that I feel blessed with. And, um, and something that, by the way, I got from my dad, because he is that person. He can come and, and look at someone and go, oh, this is what you need. And he was always that way my whole life, um, even in his hardest time when he would see, you know, he would have this way of knowing and just kind of like step up and, and like give me this one little kind of gem that got me through stuff, so. No, 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 thank you for that, sharing that thing. I know you were an avid book reader or once was, I mean, it slowed down just because life done got a little busy for you here. But speaking of books and talking about books, there was one on your life here, what would you, what would you call it? If there was a book on my life, Ooh, that's a great question. Um, um, I guess I would call it dance, love, life, and magic. <laughs> okay, do the magic. <laughs> most definitely, most definitely, most definitely. Now, as far as um, this point in your life here, what advice would you give that uh, 17, 18 year old uh, machine way? What advice this machine way would give that younger machine way? Uh -huh. You know, for one thing, I think a lot of people look back at their life and they wonder what they could tell their younger selves to change. Mm -hmm. But if you've gotten to a point where you're like, this is where I'm meant to be, 
I wouldn't yeah. change anything. I would just tell her you're on the right path. It's not necessarily easy, but just keep going. Mm. No, most definitely. Most. Well, what your parents will have to say about you now. Hmm. Well, what's funny is my mother, <laughs> my mother's gotten to a point where almost every time we talk, she's like, oh, you're just so brilliant. I'm like, oh, my goodness, mom. You know, you know she was as a, as a mother, she was always like, you can do this better. You know, like she was always trying to um, push me further and further and further. But now as an adult, apparently I can do almost no wrong. She's always like, you're so brilliant. You're so amazing. You're so, I'm like, why could you do this? Like, 30 years ago, but, but, but uh, she would have nothing but like glowing things to say, I think at this point. Um, my dad, my dad is one of those people, he's, you'll never know completely what he's really thinking. I think he's very proud of me, but there's probably that one thing that he'd be like, but I just wish she did this, but he'd never say it out loud, you know? Um, and probably what the thing is that he wished is like, but I wish she went to church because, you know, I'm, I'm not Christian which uh, people are usually shocked to find out. Apparently, I, I come off as, as uh, I guess, people don't associate um, someone not being Christian with, with uh, how giving my personality is. So. <laughs> yeah, there we go. The perceptions again, you know? Yeah. There we, uh, what's, what's on deck for you? Well, um, I'm currently teaching at um, Company and Tempo in Cromwell, really amazing studio. Um, you know, I've, I've taught for a lot of different places, and this is a studio that they always take that extra, extra step to try and figure out um, what's best for a student. And that, that is completely me, and I love working there. Um, I'm teaching at the Greater Hartford Academy of the Arts, um, really good time, some, some great kids. Um, I will be doing something with DLL Studios, which, you know, because of the pandemic, it kind of shut the program down. I haven't quite figured out what the next steps are, but because I believe very much that we need more community and more arts in our community, um, DLL Studios was always meant to be a program that had affordability and allowed kids to come and have a good time and learn dance and develop community with each other and then go out into community and share what they learned. So um, however it will come back and part of it is need to find space somewhere. Um, I would love for it to be, you know, that program that allows kids to perform and be out there and, and do things for the community. Um, and so we'll see, like I'm, I got to start making some decisions this year so we can start again in 2023. Um, and then, as you know, mom life, which can be as challenging as it is enjoyable. <laughs> and um, and I'm a wife to a great husband named Matt. Shout out, babe. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so just living life, enjoying what parts I can, enjoying taking on new challenges. <laughs> and apparently I'm going to have a lot to clean <laughs> when we are done. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. My uh, fault, I'll have a cleaning service for you, my bad. <laughs> no, never, never apologize, never apologize. I, I love to share, I love to talk. Anyone who knows me knows that. <laughs> yeah. But I want to say this before we park, though. I just, thank you. I want to say thank you. And I, as interesting as ironic, you have um, Captain America shirt on, you know, I'm um, a superhero. You, you've been a superhero to a lot of people. Oh, you know, thank uh, you. in regards to who you taught or just been in their lives or what have you. And I just want you to know that, I mean, you know, obviously I'm, I'm living proof, not only from afar, but just having my little one uh, be a part of your programs and everything. Is so like, much. Okay. <laughs> but I, nah, but I mean, you, you've been a hero to a lot of people here, to the community, to everything, anything that you touch, you, you've done great things with. And, you know, I just look forward to see what's, what's next and what you got going on. But I just really, really, from the bottom of my heart, just want to say thank you for all you've done and what you continue to do. And I just look forward to what's to come. Oh, well, thank you. Well, we'll see what the next chapter brings. I'm, I'm excited to find out too. So, yeah. Nah, so, nah, so thank you. Thank you for this time. And I know you got to collect yourself before you walk and go see that mess up. <laughs> uh, well, well, we'll see what happens. I'm not a spanker. We'll probably have to have a conversation and, and make some decisions of, of who's going <laughs> to clean what area. <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. Now, nah, Michelle, you be well. You and your family here. And I'm sure we'll, we'll cross paths soon enough. Yes. Yes, we will. All right. You have a good one. Thank you. Okay. Now, nah, thank you. Bye bye. 
Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, definitely enjoyed this doing this. I appreciate Miss Shinway just taking time out of her busy schedule here to uh, share a little bit of her world with me. So um, very, very insightful and just a delight to sit here and just listen. That said, though, I'm going to just um, step away. I put my hand over my heart. That means I feel you. Yeah.